<clears throat> Sophomore year of high school, took a week-long bus trip to Chattanooga, Tennessee to compete in something known as the Academic Olympics. It's a week-long contest where a bunch of nerds compete against each other in math and English for trophies. I still have mine. <laughs> One of the nerds that was on this trip with us knew a guy who knew a guy who knew how to find some weed. Yeah, and this was at the peak of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign, which made it even cooler. Yeah, and I remember it didn't happen right away. You know, after those first couple of puffs, it takes a few minutes, but I remember being hit by this rolling wall of euphoria and calm and this sense that everything was going to be okay. I was always a little nervous and shy, even among my fellow nerds, and I remember having this feeling that I could just finally be me. I could just finally be, you know what I mean, man? You know? And it, and it didn't happen all at once, it didn't happen right away, but I slowly began to realize that like, I really like this feeling. It makes me feel safe and secure in who I am, and I think this is gonna be my new thing. And <laughs> so, you know, as, as we grew and matured, as you know, other friends were, were discovering alcohol and you know, throwing up in the yard behind the fraternity house, I wasn't really interested in that. I was, I was always like keeping my eye out for the stoners, you know, my people, you know? <laughs> But it, it didn't always work out in my favor because, I mean, well, well look, you know, look at me. I, I, you know, even as a youngster, I resembled a middle-aged authority figure. I have... <laughs> Excuse me, do you know where I could find some marijuana? <laughs> Why don't you start with the evidence locker, narc? <laughs> no. So I, I, you know, I really enjoyed it, but I always had a hard time finding it until I moved to this town. <laughs> Started hanging out with all the kayakers and disc golfers, and you know, it became a little easier to make connections, and it became a little more easy for me to make this more of a regular part of my normal routine. Um, and you know, soon it didn't it didn't happen all at once, but I gradually began to find out that this herbal remedy was awfully nice with you know some more mundane activities, not just the adrenaline stuff, things like dinner, or <laughs> watching a movie, or just being bored, or waking up. And it, and it didn't happen all at once, but it gradually came to me, probably the same realization that maybe a few people in the audience here are having tonight, is that you know, maybe this guy has a problem. <laughs> and you know, I slowly began to realize that this might actually be true. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who didn't partake quite as much, and he said, you know, Gary, um, you always say that the weed makes the movie better and the weed makes the meal better, but really, it's, it's uh, the, the, mo the movie that makes being high better, not the other way around. And I started to think about it, and I was like, yeah, I think he's on to something. And I began to realize that I was no longer smoking to get high, but that I was smoking to feel normal. And it was those periods of time in between getting high that I was experiencing the anxiety that I thought I was repairing with the weed, a term that people who uh, are unfortunately using much harder drugs refer to as fixing. So it, I took it upon myself to get this under control, and I wanted to, you know, I decided I don't want to feel like this anymore. I don't want to constantly be in a cloud. I kind of want to remember who I am, so I decided that it was time to quit. And when I finally decided to take these steps, I thought I was prepared. You know, I bought a couple of packs of gum and a box of toothpicks, and I thought this will, you know, this will help get me through. <laughs> I remember on day one, I went through like two packs of gum and half of my toothpicks. And on day two, it was even worse than day one. Day three blew two, day two completely out of the water. And this is much more difficult than I was anticipating. So I realized that I had to switch my mindset. I had to stop thinking in terms of I'm never going to do this again and just thinking I'm not gonna do this today. It was like every single day was a new day one. And to make things even harder on myself, I didn't do this on purpose, but I made the decision to quit about three days before a, a, a solo trip to Amsterdam. <laughs> which is 
a, a bit like taking the ring back to Mount Doom if Mount Doom had museums, beautiful architecture, and amazing restaurants. But one thing I remember about this being much harder than I anticipated were the physical symptoms. While I was in Amsterdam, I suffered from insomnia, not jet lag, but insomnia, shaking, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, and the sweating. Oh my God, the sweating was so incredible. I was embarrassed every day to hang that little sign on the door that says, please change the sheets, because it was as if someone had poured a bucket of water on me while I was in bed. It was that bad. My hands were pruny, like I had just gotten out of the swimming pool. It was awful. Um, but I made it back to the States with my integrity intact, and I continued wrestling with this, these physical symptom, symptoms and the temptation for a couple of months. Now, I wanna, before I finish, I want to pause here just to, to be clear. This isn't a story about, I, I, I'm not saying that there's a marijuana problem. What I'm saying is that there's a Gary problem. I've always lived my life either from zero or a hundred with never anything in between. If I do something, I do it to excess. And I had to, to, I had to teach myself that there was just not going to be any moderation. I just had to go with zero instead, because otherwise I was going to let something else be in control of me. So um, I'm proud to report that um, today is day one. <laughs> for the 187th consecutive day in a row. Thank you.